Well, this morning, if you have notes, you can grab them. We are turning to um, or asking a, a very, very, very important question. That question is the most critical question of our whole existence. And the question is this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So how you and I answer this question will determine your eternity and shape how you live on this earth. So I've asked Pastor Lee to tell us the story of that passage. So come on up and tell us the story. All right. This story is from Luke. An expert in the law of Moses. Got that? An expert in the law of Moses stood up to test Jesus. He's going to test Jesus. He said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a kind of softball question to a good Jew. That's a Sabbath school question. There's nothing hard about that answer if you are a Jew. So the test couldn't have been that question. I think the test was going to be the next question. He was going to start doing some legalese stuff, right? But Jesus says, well, what's the law say? You're an expert in the law. What's the law say? How do you read it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered well, Jesus said. Go and do that, and you will live. Seeking to justify himself. Which tells me that he was already on the defensive. Something had just happened. The balance had just shifted. Right? Seeking to justify himself. The man was expecting a kind of legal answer, a kind of theological discussion. So he reverts to the test, but he says, I don't know what's going on with him. He says, well, who's my neighbor? So Jesus says, a man was on his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And on the way, he was attacked by thieves who took his clothes, beat him badly, and left him bloody and battered by the side of the road. After a while, a priest walked by who knew the law, who knew what God required, and was not about to break it. And he passed by on the other side. He broke no law. Any more than you if you pass somebody today. After a while, Another man passed by, a Levite, who also knew the law. Knew that nothing required him to stop. And he went on his way. Then, a Samaritan walked by, who did not know the law. Samaritans don't know the law. They don't observe the law. They don't worship properly. But a Samaritan happens by, and what's he do? He goes to the man and bandages up his wounds. He pours on wine to disinfect and oil to soothe. And he picks the man up and puts him on his donkey and takes him to the nearest inn. And he keeps him there overnight 
and takes care of him. And the next day, he says to the innkeeper, here's two days wages. I'm going to be gone, but when I come, take care of him. But when I come back, if you've incurred any other expenses, I'll cover them. So Jesus said to the expert in the law, who was the neighbor to the man attacked by thieves? All right. The one who showed mercy to him. You've answered well. Go and do, do likewise. That was a interesting, powerful response to a question that's important. The question asked by this religious lawyer was, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now, in the book of Luke, this question was asked two times. Now, the first time is in the passage we're looking at this morning. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And the second time that this question was asked of Jesus was by the rich, young ruler in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Now, in answering this question, and perhaps the same question of our heart as well, Jesus always looks to the heart behind the questions when he interacts with us. Now, in the case of, if you're familiar with the story of the rich, young ruler. When that young man asked Jesus, what must I do? Same question, same words, to inherit eternal life. Jesus addressed the one issue of his heart. This young man knew that he was to love the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he knew he was supposed to love his neighbor as himself. However, in the throne, per se, of his heart, the ruling place, his riches, his money, and his service and value of it was higher than his value and service to God. So he says, get rid of your money, give it to the poor, and follow me. And in that story, that young man left with a heavy heart. Jesus addressed what was going on. On in his heart. And in our passage for today, this lawyer loved his religion more than he loved God and people. And this is a good warning for all of us, especially in our American context. Often, those of us who proclaim that they love God at the most highest point. Sometimes we fool ourselves because we love God, but when it really comes down to God or our money, we would choose our money. Or choose God as a means to getting more money. Versus loving God and his sovereignty and his goodness. And his grace to us more than any other thing. And we have to be careful. And these are good, quote unquote, church going religious people. And in this passage, again, here's a professional religious person, a professional Christian. Knew the word, knew what it said. And yet he was deceived. Because he was trying to trick even God himself. And Jesus pointed in telling this story that this man actually served religion more than he served the Savior. We as church people have to be 
aware of that ourselves. God, what does your word actually say? And God, will you have that word impact my heart so that I can live the truth of what is said to the people around me? So the question that was asked was a good question. Right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's good because it was a question about a th- eternity. This man actually, I believe, was concerned about what comes next. Because in the math of our life, we're only here for a short time in comparison to eternity. So he was asking the right question. However, how the question was asked revealed this man's world view. And how we ask questions of God, of his word, reveals our worldview, how we see things. Because of this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He believed that eternal life would be earned by how we live. That way of looking at eternity and of God and of Scripture, is the same way for the majority of people in the world. They believe that eternal life can be earned. Let's turn to this passage, Luke 10, 25. On one occasion, right, here it is, we just heard it, an ex in the law stood up not to receive from Jesus but to test him sometimes we do the same trying to test God he said teacher what must I do to inherit eternal life again this is the morality scale thought And over this Thanksgiving, or perhaps if you did a survey at the place where you work or where you go to school, if you asked someone why or what happens when you die or why would God permit you to enter his glory as heaven, often people say, well, I'm not that bad of a person, right? When you kind of put my life, you put it in the balance of the scales, I think, by and large, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. I haven't killed anybody. Not as bad, and this is how we usually think. I'm not as bad as Hitler. Like, like he's the level of our morality. Now, there's some other people that are, you know, better than me, and I'm not perfect, but, you know, if you weigh it, I think I'm pretty good. And so the thought is, and perhaps that this man was thinking the same thing, that if our good works outweigh our bad works, then perhaps we'll get in. And so he asked Jesus the question that often people, even religious people ask. Well, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. Now, Jesus heard this question, and he knew what was in this man's heart, and he knew that he knew the law, and he knew what was going on, so he just answered a question with a question. And by the way, have you ever asked God a question, and you hear in your heart another question from him? (laughs) Often that happens, right? He gets to our heart, so he says, all right, I'm going to I'll show a couple things. You're not asking me to know the answer. You're asking to test me. So, hey, hey, lawyer, what do you say? What does the law say? Because I know you know the answer. And so this is verse 26 of Luke chapter 10. Jesus returns a question for a question, and often that happens in our conversations with God. So here he goes. What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? This man answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, 
with all your mind. That's Deuteronomy. Love your neighbor as yourself, which comes from Leviticus chapter 19. He knew his stuff. All the law and the prophets hang upon the love of God and the love of others or expressed in the love of others. And Jesus told him, nice job. You have answered correctly. You know what the Old Testament scriptures revealed, the heart of them. Now, Mr. Lawyer, who wants to play the morality scale game, do this and you will live. But this man wanted to justify himself. Make excuses or uh, have explanations why he does what he does. And people who um, believe eternity is weighed by morality will say the same things. Explanations why they did or didn't do some things. And it's a game that we play. So this man wanting to justify himself said, well then... Who's my neighbor? So if you want to justify yourself, that means that by your own morality that you would be free of the penalty of your sin. That's called justification or just if I have never sinned. If you want the ledger of your life blanked out and be declared that you are perfect and righteous and do not deserve any type of consequence. In order to justify yourself, you have to live the law perfectly. The problem with that is that no one can do this. Why? Because no one fully and completely and perfectly loves God. And no one loves perfectly and fully and completely the people around them. So Jesus says, Mr. Lawyer Man, if, if you want to... You understand scripture. Again, there was just Old Testament scripture at that time. Okay. If you understanding of scripture is correct, he knew that he had to live perfectly in relationship with God, relationship with others. And if he hit the bullseye every time, he could walk into eternity being justified by his own behavior. Self justification. I should be let in because of my goodness. He says, if you want to go that way, go for it. Go ahead, do it. And people who believe that even today, God says, go ahead and do it. And he allows us to fail. Because we cannot do this. The New Testament is explained very clearly by the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory and the perfection of God. No matter how good you are, you're not God good. Thank you. So this whole morality scale doesn't work as a ticket to get in God's kingdom because we've fallen short and the wages of sin is death. Because God loves, he must hold sin accountable. Do you know... That the judgment and wrath of God is based in the love of God. Hear me. Romans in particular and the gospel in particular tells us so much. 
The glory of God is his perfection, and his perfection is measured by his perfect love. And his perfect love requires justice. And his justice bears no one who does not love perfectly. This is what the law demands. This is what the law says. The law reveals us. If you look at the Ten Commandments, and you go down, yeah, I'm doing pretty good, I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. The first four, by the way, of the Ten Commandments have to do with our love of God. The following six have to do with our love of other people. All the law and the prophets hang, all of the case law that we see in Leviticus and where we see in Numbers and things that we see in the Old Testament in particular is built upon those two things. And if we look at that, you might say you're okay, but then Jesus comes on the scene. You remember his famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, where he says, well, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And most people are like, I'm good. He says, but I tell you, if you lust in your heart, you have committed adultery in your heart. I'm not doing so good. Well, you've heard it said, do not murder anyone. And we're like, okay, I'm doing well. And let me tell you, if you have anger in your heart, you murder them in your heart. Okay, not doing so good, right? And so it's always been about the heart because our external expression is based upon our internal condition. And internally, we desire to do good. And you see this in Romans again, but we have this battle because our fleshly nature, the propensity, the inclination of our hearts is to rebel against God and trust in our own self. The law reveals us. We look at it and say, we have fallen short. In order to get to the good news, we have to understand the bad news. Right? The bad news is none of us are justified according to the law. We're all guilty regardless of how, quote-unquote, good you are or good you think you are. We have a problem. So the law reveals us. We have to know the standard of God. And we look in the mirror and say, yeah, I failed. But the good news is that the gospel heals us. The law reveals us. And then the good news is that the gospel makes us Whole makes us right with God. It's the good news of His grace. So the questions were asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with another question. Well, what does the law say? And then we have to ask a question in our New Testament lens. Well, what does the gospel say? For all have sinned, and falling short of the glory of God, which is the bad news, but then it couples with the good news. And all are justified by, don't you like this? His grace. The gift. The gift. Through the redemption redeeming Jesus redeems us that is in Christ Jesus if you want to self justify go ahead you will and are failing with that no one is righteous But we are justified by his grace as a gift. 
that the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, there is no one like Him. Christianity is focused and built upon Jesus, the righteous one. God became flesh. Why was that important? In order to take this, our sins upon himself, he had to be like us. God in the flesh. And Jesus, Scripture says, faced temptations just like us. You're tempted to steal. Now, this might seem weird, but there's temptation perhaps to Christ to sin, to do that. He had to face, as the second Adam, these temptations. But he did not give in. Just like Adam in the garden, being free of sin, still had a choice to make. And Jesus, being free of sin, still had choices to make. And he did so perfectly. Jesus could have just walked up to heaven, I'm here, checked his record, clean. He could have said, yeah, and just walked right in. But he didn't choose to do that. You know why? God so loved you, the world, knowing that God's love required God's justice, knowing And we fall short. He offered himself because of God's love for us, because of God's perfection. It's what Scripture calls an atoning sacrifice. That is, someone taking your place, like you were guilty and you had to pay $1,000 and someone else came in and paid it for you. That's what he did. People often ask the question, and perhaps you've asked it yourself, why do bad things happen to good people? That question only applies to one person. Jesus. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> He's the only one that's good. The answer why did bad things happen to Jesus is because of love. He took it upon himself. A question that applies to us is why do good things happen to bad people? That's because of love as well. Because of grace. given to us through faith. Now we know in the gospel, Romans chapter 10 says, if you confess with your mouth an external expression, something that we can measure, something that we can know, that Jesus is, what's the word? Lord. Not just good, not just a teacher, not just a rabbi, not just a moral authority, not just someone, perhaps a prophet, but Lord, do you understand that? If you confess with your mouth and recognize he is Lord, he is king, he is sovereign, he is right, he has all authority. If you confess with your mouth saying he is the Lord, and you believe in your heart, that God himself raised him from the dead, that there's only redemption in Christ, you will be safe. That's good news, and we say amen to that. Good news is why we reverence and honor and worship the God-made flesh. This is why the name of Jesus is above every name. And that every knee will bow to him. 
This is the Lord of life. This is your Savior. This is our King. He is the Lord, and He asks us to place our faith in Him. He is who He says He is. We place our faith in Him that His blood is enough. His blood washes us. His sacrifice makes us justified. He asks us to believe it in our heart. And if we believe it in our heart, we will express it in our life. You get how that connects. You can't say that I love Jesus and then live like the devil. How do we measure your love for God interiorly? It's measured by what we can see exteriorly. Exteriorly. Thank you for that, English teachers. Got to (laughs) be... Got to be painful for you sometimes. What is that man saying up there? (laughs) Okay, that was great. (laughs) Help the brother, come on. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) You know what I'm saying, kind of, maybe, hopefully. Unfortunately, sometimes think, well, I believe in Christ. It gets me off the hook. I can live however I want. The truth is, if you actually love Christ, you'll live how Christ wants you to live. Now, do we still sin? Yeah. I wish I didn't. Sins of commission, things I do, things of omission, things that I should do that I don't do. We need God's grace. That's what the gospel says. So here's another question, and this whole message is focused in on questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What does the law say? What does the gospel say? Now what must we do now? And it's pretty simple. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one, believe in the gospel. Put your faith in Christ today. Renew your faith in Christ today. That's one of the primary functions of communion, you know that? Or we're going to celebrate that at the end. As those of us who are in the faith, we renew our commitment, renew and say, I believe in the body, I believe in the blood that is broken and shed for me. I believe and reapply. And not that you're saved through communion, because you're not. Okay? We're saved through the blood of Jesus and belief in his life. But we take communion to receive and say, I believe and I'm a part of this. It's both um, vertical and horizontal. Right? Believe the gospel. If you are trying to justify yourself, you can't do it. Put your faith in Christ. Not in your religion, not in your works, not in all of the Bible verses you've memorized, but in Christ. Believe him. Most of us in here probably are there, but perhaps not every one today. There is no one like him, and he urges you, trust him. Recognize who he is. Follow him. So number one, what do we do now? Believe in the gospel. Second, live by the gospel. It's a believe in, believe in your heart, and then it's a live by, by his grace. 
If the gospel is just more information, we're doomed. But if the gospel is a new life transformation by the Spirit of God, we're safe. So number one, believe in the gospel. Second, live by the gospel. And we do this not to gain eternal life. We do this because we have been given eternal life. You understand the difference? We live our Christianity not to gain God's favor. We live it out because we have God's favor. Do you understand that? Huge difference. God, because you have made me new by your son and you're renewing my mind through your word, God, help me to live this out today. Express it today. We need God's grace and forgiveness to do this every day. Day. And this story shows us how we can show our love of God by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And it's interesting that this lawyer asked the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus actually asked the question by telling this story, saying, are you a neighbor? So the question is not about the neighbor uh, across the street. The question is, who are you? Because who we are determines how we connect with those around us. That's the guts of it. So this is how we can live by the gospel after believing in the gospel <laughs> First thing we have to recognize that we're the guy by the side of the road. We need Christ. And then he says, now you are the body. Now I want you to live in me to be an agent of the gospel. So how do we live this? I'm not going to make it complicated. We see it right here. Verse 33 of Luke 10. But the Samaritan, as he traveled came to where the man was. And when he saw him, circle that. Number one, how do you live by the gospel? See people. <laughs> Who they are, really, what they truly need. Most of us just look at people God asked us to see them. You can look at your neighbor. I have, a, I, have, I have neighbors all around. I know about them, but the question is, do I know them? What's happening in their hearts? What's happening in their world? What's happening there? I want to ask you to do more than just notice people. I want you to see them. God, help me to see them. What's happening in her life? What's going on in his life? What's happening around there? See them like Christ sees them so often. We just pass people up. Right? Or we avoid them. Or we walk to the other side. So I have to ask you, God, give me gospel eyes so that I can see people. Big, big time. The big time with your family over Thanksgiving. Right? Don't just notice them, see them. God, help me to see their story. God, help me to see their condition. God, help me to secondly, and this is amazing, when he saw him going back to this passage, he took pity on him. See people, second, have pity. That is compassion. This is sympathy for their plight. Every person has a story. Once you understand their story, you can now connect with them emotionally. Wonder what it would be like 
to be a single mom with four kids from three guys. Wonder what it would be like to have this done in the family of origin. But there's abandonment and abuse. Wonder what it would be like having the stresses of the corporate world pouring upon and the bills piling up. What would that be like? What would it be like? Hearing the story, seeing people, when you do that, you start to have compassion or sympathy or pity. This man who was a neighbor saw, connected, stepped towards it, understood, and then there was this emotive connection. Have pity, God. Help us for that. God, help the day in which we hear a story and our heart is so hard it doesn't penetrate. Now, granted, there's people that lie to us. Have to see that who it is. But second, to live by the gospel, see people have pity. Thirdly, pretty easy. <laughs> Heal wounds. <laughs> He went to him and bandaged his wounds. Take what you have to help heal the wounds. Now, I'm not just talking physical wounds, right? I'm not saying, well, you have to have a first aid kit everywhere you go. I'm not saying that, right? But if someone has a problem, help that too, right? Heal wounds, and everyone is wounded in some way. Amen, Pastor. I'm good. No, you've been wounded. How do I know that? You're a human. We're all wounded. Let's be the bomb. Let's give a word of encouragement. It could be a piece of advice. It could be a helping hand. It could be showing up. It could be like a surgeon coming in to do surgery of the soul. One of my main jobs is to to care for souls. Do what you can. Heal wounds. See people. Have pity. Thirdly, heal wounds in whatever form these words wounds come, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Help somehow that we live this. Fourthly and lastly. Provide for needs. And we see this right from this passage, verse 34. Saw him, had pity on him, went to him, bandaged his wounds. And then he put the man in his own donkey. Right? Provided for a need. Brought him to an end. Took care of him. Provide for needs. One of the reasons you and I have needs is because we can give and receive love. If I have a need, for instance, if I need a ride from the airport, which I do, I'm going to go see family this week, a way for someone to show love to me is say, hey, I'll pick you up, bro. Showing love. We all have needs and we all can meet needs. So do what you can. You can't help everybody, but you can help somebody. This is how we live the gospel. Simple. See people. Have pity. Heal wounds. Provide for needs. That we live by the gospel because we believe in the gospel. So that's my challenge. This is a challenge for all of us this morning. Number one, do you believe in the gospel? And you might be here again, and you say, you know what, I don't know, I know about Christ, I don't know Christ, today is your day. Place your faith in Him. And those of you who believe, renew your faith in Him. Do you believe the good news? Do you understand the bad news? Then are you trusting in Him? Believe in the gospel today. 
And if today is your first time, I want to pray with you. There'll be a couple over here after communion who would like to pray with you. Put your faith in him. And then second, I want us, Christ wants us to be living by the gospel. And as we go into Thanksgiving week, right, or we're gathering with people, some we probably haven't seen for a while, some of your families are hard to love. Mm -hmm. Let me drop the other shoe. Some of you are hard to love. This season, this season. Not really. No, just kidding. <laughs> you guys understand this, right? I want you to think about this. I want to put it stronger. God wants you to think about this. Who cares what I want? Let's care about what he wants. God, help me to do this. Help me to display your love for people, even this week, over this season. And so we're going to end this service with communion. Bob Carlson's going to lead us, if you can come on up. Now next week, we're going to start our Advent season. And Pastor Gordon here is going to be bringing the message next week which is going to be great.